thank Andres. I want to thank uh, Linda for the warm welcome and Jim for all the wonderful collaboration throughout the years. It's really my honor to be here um, at the Child Study Center, which is really the bastion of uh, the highest caliber work in this area and has influenced what I do too. And so I hope some of you here today might consider working in low resource settings, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. And what I wanted to share today is really a 15 year labor of love. Uh, moving from observational and longitudinal research to eventually designing and evaluating programs for war-affected war children, youth, and families in the resource settings. And so what I'd like to do with my presentation today is tell you a little bit about our research program on children and global adversity at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, talk with you about some of the conceptual models that underpin that, our mixed methods approach to working in diverse cultures, and then go into the example of Sierra Leone and the intergenerational study of war and how we've moved that towards intervention services research and now looking at how do you take these interventions to scale, uh, especially when the health system is devastated by the vestiges of civil war and now the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Uh, so first of all, to say more about the research program on children and global adversity, we are very interested in studying um, from a child development perspective processes that contribute to risk and resilience in children and families that face adversity of many sorts, and I'll tell you a bit about that. But in doing this, our interest is on capacities and strengths and not just deficits. And what we hope to do is to contribute to this no-do gap in overcoming it, that we know a lot about the science of early adversity on the impact on child mental health and development, but when you look at the quality of the programs that are delivered in very low resource settings, they're often quite poor. So how do we overcome this no-do gap, especially in fragile countries, war-affected countries, um, to inform more effective programs and policies? And so throughout the years, I've been able to uh, interact with a number of scholars in this area. I was delighted to get to know Julius Richmond, who, as you know, is a former U.S. Surgeon General, uh, and also was the mastermind um, behind the scale-up of the Head Start program in the United States. And Julius Richmond spoke about this virtuous cycle between strengthening the evidence base and how we can use that to galvanize <coughs> political will through improved social strategies to impact public policy and better programs and policies for very vulnerable children and families. And we see our role as scientists as contributing to that virtuous cycle in strengthening the evidence base around what the issues are, but also how you can think about strengthening <coughs> services systems. So I mentioned adversity, and when I'm speaking of adversity, I'm really talking about two exceptions to recent improvements um, in child health, uh, which around the world you're seeing improvements in infant mortality, uh, child mortality, maternal mortality, but there are two big exceptions to this. And these are regions affected by armed conflict. So if you look at those that buck the trend in terms of under five deaths, there's many that have a conflict in their recent history, and also countries affected by HIV and AIDS that have a high burden of HIV and AIDS. And when you look at places like Rwanda, where I've also worked, sometimes we have both these vectors of risk occurring at the same time. So our research program sort of has three broad domains that we are uh, attending to in our portfolio. The first I'm going to talk about today, which is the topic of children affected by armed conflict. In addition to Sierra Leone, uh, we've worked on the Chechen crisis. Uh, we've also worked on the Ethiopian Eritrea border with Kunama refugees and in northern Uganda on the topic of child soldiers, as well as uh, interventions for depression in um, young boys uh, and young, young women and um, young boys uh, who are in internally displaced people camps. And then I've worked on the topic of children affected by HIV and AIDS. This was a collaboration with Partners in Health, uh, as well as the government of Rwanda. And we adapted Bill Beardsley's Family Talk intervention um, for, for the prevention of depression symptoms. And uh, found, again, effects when doing family home visiting work done by lay people with excellent training and supervision structures um, that were significant for reducing depression in HIV affected kids. And then uh, lastly, I won't have time to talk about all of these, but when we have Q&A, maybe we can broaden uh, the discussion. We're also working on the topics of refugees resettled here in the United States and currently have funding from the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities for a community-based participatory research project with Somali Bantu and Bhutanese refugees here in New England. Uh, so many different uh, domains that we're touching on, but across these we articulate this mixed methods research model. And 
we realize we're outsiders from most of the cultures that we're working within. So we're partnering with local academics, local stakeholders, local community organizations around shared interests in a topic such as advancing uh, better outcomes for kids in the context of adversity. And we have to think about, well, how are we going to assess something like mental health problems in children around here, or family functioning, or protective processes like social support? So we start often with qualitative inquiry. This is what's really made me a mixed methods researcher. So we try to learn about what are the local indicators for this sort of problem? Are there terms for these things? How can we communicate in local terminology so that we're joining with people uh, about the right issues? and also so that we're measuring things well and thinking about assessment uh, in a very thoughtful way. And I know in JCAP we published a few of these validation efforts, uh, especially adapting measures for the assessment of depression as well as functioning in children. And then once we have that information, we can also learn about intervention models that could fit the context that are culturally informed. We improve our assessments, we often conduct validation studies, and then we can come back and implement those intervention models and evaluate them using some of the most rigorous designs possible, including randomized control trials, cluster randomized trials, implementation, hybrid designs, and this is something we've iterated across a range of different settings. So when we, when we talk about the topic of uh, children in armed conflict, this is not a peripheral issue. If you look at some of UNICEF's estimates around um, children living in countries that have ongoing conflicts, such as the Syrian crisis, which is now the largest humanitarian crisis since World War II, uh, and countries coming out of conflict, like Liberia, Sierra Leone, that are still fragile because of the vestiges of a recent conflict, it's estimated that a billion children and adolescents live in countries affected by armed conflict. So these are not side issues. Uh, if you look globally, there were 19.5 million refugees and an estimated 38.2 internally displaced people at the end of 2014. Oftentimes these numbers are a majority under the age of 18, so issues of children and youth are extremely important. And what's happening is the nature of war itself is changing. We're seeing an increased involvement of non-state actors, militia groups, rebel groups that have little concern for the treatment of civilians. And what we're seeing in modern warfare today is oftentimes what we would call wars of destabilization. So they're targeting the infrastructure. They're targeting the fabric of life. They're targeting schools, hospitals, communities where children live and grow and where families um, spend their time. And this has implications for the survival of children, but also the trajectory of development that they're placed along in terms of access to school, access to health care, uh, their extended family networks, their peer networks, and all of this really shapes the trajectory of development over time. So when we look at the global burden of mental disorders due to violence and conflict, we see in conflict-affected countries much higher levels. Uh, if you look at things like traumatic, traumatic stress reactions, depression, anxiety, and high-risk behaviors, we see elevated levels um, across a range of different studies, as you might expect. Um, take just the studies of child soldiers that meet diagnostic uh, thresholds for PTSD. And some of these, they've done really good validation work to really think about appropriate clinical thresholds, like Brandon Court's work in Nepal. So some of the studies in uh, northern Uganda, they're ranging from about 27% to 35%, and 55% of Brandon Court's former child soldiers in Nepal um, met thresholds. Uh, however, we have a lot of cross-sectional studies. Uh, a lot of research still uh, looks at how much exposure to war-related events and then how much subsequent psychopathology or almost concurrent psychopathology can be detected, but very little attention to the course of development, to the role of post-conflict environment, post-conflict risk and protective factors, and we just don't have enough in terms of longitudinal work on these topics. Uh, and we're really lacking in intervention research. So despite the gravity of the problem and the size of the problem, not enough research is yet being done on how to think about intervention models that can have an impact. Um, so in thinking about how to intervene in any one child's mental health, we have to think, of course, developmentally and ecologically. Going back to you know the classic sort of Yuri Bronfenbrenner models where you're thinking about one child's outcome is shaped by certainly genetic factors, age, gender, temperament, intelligence, but also what's going on at the level of the family, who's available to the child, what's the nature of caregiver relationships, caregiver mental health, uh, extended networks, uh, other mentors in the lives of the young person, and then also what's going on at the level of the community in terms of access to education, access to a livelihood or a path forward for that young person. 
And then the cultural, political, historical context of the macro system that's oftentimes at the root of the conflict itself, and how people think about healing, reconciliation, and moving forward. And we were just talking about the after effects of the Rwandan genocide and how that looks very different than um, OPT or other parts of the world that are affected by conflict. So now to move into the example of Sierra Leone. I have to mention, this is not just my work. It's the work of a huge team of collaborators, uh, including an amazing local research team in Sierra Leone. We work with Caritas, uh, which is the relief arm of the Catholic Church. Uh, we've had many tremendous students and postdocs and trainees at Harvard over the years, and funding support from USAID, Grand Challenges Canada, US Institutes for Peace, UBS Optimist Foundation, and now the National Institutes of Child Health and Development and also collaborators um, throughout the years, including Nate Hansen, who was here at Yale for a long time, is now at the University of Georgia, Mark Callens, Chris Blattman, uh, who was also here, um, and Adi Inc. Akinsulari Smith at CUNY. So it used to be when I would give a talk about Sierra Leone that people had never heard of it. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, due to the Ebola outbreak of 2014-2015, it's been very much in the news. You probably yourself saw pictures of what it looked like on the streets of Freetown when the epidemic came to the capital. Here we see uh, Sierra Leone neighboring Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and Liberia on the coast of West Africa. Now, Sierra Leone is a teeny nation, about six million people. Uh, for a number of years, it's been vying for the bottom of the UN Human Development Index with extremely high rates of infant mortality, maternal mortality. <coughs> so the canary was already in the mind that the health system was not functional in Sierra Leone before the Ebola outbreak. Uh, other things that place it on the Human Development Index with such a low ranking are very high rates of um, unemployment and underemployment, low literacy, especially affecting uh, young women, and uh, very low GDP per capita. And then the Ebola crisis led to over 8,700 confirmed cases and nearly 4,000 confirmed deaths, and massive health system strain and eventually collapse. Uh, so you see there Father Peter and some of the from Caritas and some of the awareness raising campaigns and hand washing campaigns in Freetown. Now, before the Ebola epidemic, you had the vestiges of an 11 year civil war, uh, which in Sierra Leone raged from 1991 to 2002. This uh, war came to the capital. If you've seen the movie Blood Diamond, you've seen a Hollywood portrayal of the tragedy in Sierra Leone during the war. I used to work in northern Uganda, and you could sit at an internet cafe in Kampala and not know that there was a war raging in the north. But in Sierra Leone, it came to Freetown. It came to the capital. And the war uh, displaced about 75% of the country's population at some point in time over the course of the war and was infamous for the involvement of children in armed forces and armed groups. And uh, it's estimated that upwards of 20,000 children were involved in this way. And a feature of this war is that rebels, especially the Revo Revolutionary United Front rebels, the RUF, would abduct children and force them, take them, <coughs> force them to commit atrocities against people from their own community, against loved ones, against neighbors, uh, with an intention to sever ties to make it impossible for those kids to feel they could ever run away and be accepted back home. So with this is the reality, uh, what did that look like at the end of the war when thousands of kids were coming out of fighting forces? And so it was um, decided that if at all possible, it was in the best interest of children to return to their families and communities, but they had to think about how to do that. And so they set up interim care centers all throughout the country. These were run by non-governmental organizations and by the government. Uh, this is a painting of one that I worked at in Kono, the diamond mining district of Sierra Leone. And I love this painting because I would go to that interim care center and it looks so dingy and underfunded. And, but look at this beautiful, vibrant place that this former child soldier has painted. You know, it's a place of calm, of playfulness, of support. And social workers at the center would get to know the kids, engage them in psychosocial activities, as they're called, you know, recreation, some basic numeracy and literacy, and then get kids to start to talk about their history and engage in what was called a tracing interview. And so a social worker would find out how the young person got involved, who they were last with, their thoughts about going home. And then armed with that information, social workers would go to those communities and family members identified in the story to see if there was the possibility of the young person returning home. And they'd use video, use other sort of techniques to make that connection because a lot of um, young people were worried that they wouldn't be accepted back home. Now another feature of this were um, community reintegration sensitization campaigns. 
So they would hold town hall style meetings, like coming together like this and talk about the fact that several kids from the area had been found. There was the possibility for them to come back. What did people think of this? And open up a conversation, but also take the temperature of that community to see if it was going to be possible for that young person to return. Now, another feature is a lot of young people just returned home as, as the rebel groups disbanded. So you also have this dynamic of self-reintegration in addition to those who went through formal interim care centers. So our study started around that time. And the intention was to try to understand um, processes that contribute to psychosocial adjustment and community reintegration. And like the, the model I showed you, it's a mixed method study. So we're doing repeat survey measures over time, 2002, 2004, 2008. We were on course for 2016 until the Ebola outbreak. Uh, now we're finishing up in 2017 in the fourth wave of data collection. And we've also done deep dive qualitative interviews and narratives. So we have a subsample of young people where we have repeat qualitative interviews with them and their caregivers and people from the community sort of putting together their life story. And these are very vulnerable populations, so we always had to have, uh, with our local research team, social workers embedded to help uh, refer out those needing additional services. But we've also been in a very ethically complicated situation where we've been the only ones following up some of these young people many years out, and the social services and mental health services are absolutely lacking. So if we could get everyone in the sample, it's a sample, a cohort of 529 young people, about a third of them female, they were 10 to 17 when we first started the study and we got the main portion of the sample by getting the registry list uh, from that NGO that ran the interim care center that was serving five districts of Sierra Leone and we took all of those uh, who were under the age of 18 uh, between 10 and uh, 17 uh, who were interested to participate and gave consent we had very high uh, participation rates and then we went to the same communities where those young people were being placed and tried to, in about half of the sample, have a representative community sample that was random. Um, now, what we found was we couldn't ask ethically about who'd been a former child soldier and who hadn't. And so it was a real struggle um, to find a comparison group who were not affected. And in that diamond mining district, a lot of young people were involved in fighting forces, the civilian defense forces. If you read Ishmael Bea's book, he was with the CDF. Um, and also the RUF was very impactful in that region. So we had a lot of self-reintegrated youth who went home on their own and we couldn't find this nice comparison group we had hoped for. What, yes. what was the ethical issue about asking? Uh, asking if someone's a child soldier or not when you show up at their door. Because it would they'd be at risk? Yeah, there could be retribution. And also just community distress about who are these people, why are they asking? Um, so we never got this pure, clean comparison group. We have about 40 in our sample who were not involved in any fighting forces, but the rest are, uh, it's a huge cohort of uh, young people who are involved with armed forces and armed groups. And um, to make lemonade out of uh, lemons, we decided to add a self-reintegrated sample at time two. So we had the roster of an NGO that was doing outreach to kids who had no reintegration services, and we used the same procedures. Um, to recruit them, added them to the sample, which brought in more girls. And now we've been following the whole cohort over time as they grow up and as they've now become young adults. So in terms of measures, and please feel free to stop me if you do have questions or other things that aren't clear, I don't mind that at all. Uh, of course, we're looking at basic demographics, but we're also looking at adjustment over time. And we were able to piggyback on the work of Marianne Lockery out of Boston College and Oxford Refugee Studies Program. And she had pulled a bunch of common child development checklists and done <clears throat> ethnographic work in Sierra Leone and Uganda to look at the fit of these items um, to those two African contexts. And so her scale has subscales for uh, internalizing, externalizing depression, anxiety-like indicators, as well as hostility, aggression. But what I like about it is it also has more positive um, interpersonal relationships. So there are um, items asking about interpersonal relationships, pro-social attitudes, and behaviors. So we were able to look both at um, problem domains, but also some of the more positive and interpersonal aspects of um, how young people are adjusting. And then we have a measure of war experiences adapted from the Columbia Child War Trauma Questionnaire. And with our qualitative work, developed indicators of community and family acceptance, uh, how well the child feels accepted, how well the caregiver feels they're accepted in the community. And uh, another very important measure that we added was uh, an adaptation of David Williams' Everyday Discrimination Scale to look at stigma. 
and I'll show you a bit about how stigma plays out over time. We got a lot of pushback on adding classic standard scales um, for depression, anxiety, and PTSD from our NGO partners. Um, we eventually uh, arrived at adding in the Hopkins Symptom Checklist and the PTSDRI, um, which we've had in the sample. And then as young people have gotten older, we've looked at issues of post-conflict functioning. Have they finished <coughs> school? Have they been able to hold down a job? Uh, do they have a family? Are they um, starting to raise kids themselves? And then we also look at post-conflict adversity, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, civic engagement. So there's a lot to look at in this data set uh, as they get older. Now this is a paper that we published in Child Development that just gives you a snapshot of some of the toxic stress exposures. And I don't think I need to talk about, you know, some stress is good, but sometimes repeat activation of the bodily stress response in a situation like this takes kids in a very different direction. So if you look at, these are the child soldiers who went through the reintegration center. This is just to give you a snapshot of their experiences. <coughs> Average age of abduction was 10. Average length of time with a fighting force, four years. So imagine you're being taken from your family by force and socialized by an armed group for four years in isolation of your attachment figures. So you can already imagine developmentally what that means for children. Uh, when we looked at war exposures, uh, they were very similar for girls and boys when it came to things like frontline fighting, reconnaissance <coughs> missions, carrying weapons. But then when it came to sexual violence, it was off the charts for females at about 45%. That's likely underreported. And 5% of boys also reported sexual violence. And this is often repeat sexual violence. More than a quarter of our sample reported having been involved in injuring or killing others. And half the sample reported being forced to use drugs or alcohol to inure them to the violence they were being involved in. So we're in a very different domain of toxic stress exposure with the sample. Now I wanted to show you some um, growth models that look at change in those outcomes over time and what shapes it. So the upper part of the chart here are predictors of baseline or where you start on this particular outcome. And then the second part are predictors of growth or change over time. So we see if you look at internalizing, which is those subscales from Oxford on anxiety and depression, you start at higher levels of these problems if you were longer with an armed group, if you experienced sexual violence, and if you came back to stigma. So already there's a mixing. You've got the conflict-related exposures and the post-conflict factors um, both at play. And then predictors of change over time, we see increases in these sorts of problems for people who were young when they were first involved, and for those who came back to many daily hardships. So again, the mixing of the post-conflict and the conflict-affected um, war exposures. Now, on the protective side, it doesn't fully mitigate, but there is a protective effect for when community acceptance was higher at baseline, and if it improved over time. And why those protective factors really matter is we can do something about them. Same with the modifiable risk factors. There are some things here that we can leverage when we start to think about intervention models, and we started to really do a lot of thinking about that. For externalizing, these are the kind of outcomes people worry about with former child soldiers, um, problems with anger, aggression, hostility. We see that young people start at higher levels if at baseline they came back to higher levels of stigma. Uh, and we see trajectories of increase in externalizing, which is concerning for those who have killed or injured others. Uh, so again, the post-conflict and the war-related exposures are both present. In terms of protective factors, again, increases in community acceptance, sort of the mirror image of stigma, is having a very small role to play in terms of offsetting some of those relationships. Adaptive and pro-social behavior. Now, I think this is an incredibly important outcome when thinking about young people like this because they do come back to the community and it's a test. How well you can interact with others, how well you're seen as being a part of the collectivist culture is really important. It signals to everyone if you're going to be with them or someone who's feared and distrusted. So adaptive and pro-social behavior, we see young people start at higher um, levels of this if they had more years in school and if they started at higher community acceptance. In terms of deficits in adaptive and pro-social behavior, we see those who killed or injured others, so again, an important risk factor, but also in the face of stigma, um, the trajectory is much more negative. Now more clings to this in terms of protective factors, so we see a very um, small but important role um, with increases in community acceptance, remaining in school, and also having access to social support. And those things are important to look at because there's something that we can think about for intervention. 
So it's one thing to show you growth models, but I thought I'd share a vignette, a case uh, vignette, um, from a young person in our study. This is not his real name, um, but I'll call him Sar. Uh, when Sar was seven, he was in the bush collecting firewood with his grandmother when the rebels surrounded them. Uh, the grandmother pleaded for them to leave the boy, but they said he'd make a nice uh, houseboy for the wife of a rebel commander. And uh, Sar was separated from his family. Um, like the rest of the sample, he was four years with the Revolutionary United Front. During that time, he witnessed countless massacres, bombings, amputations, shootings. He was forced to take drugs. Um, and after the war, they had a hard time connecting Sar back with his family. And some of what contributed to that, when we interviewed the mother, she talks about suffering from Hoil At. I don't know if anyone here has ever been to Sierra Leone or knows Creo, because I'm about to botch Creo many times. Um, but Hoil At is uh, the local um, term for your heart can spoil. It's a depression-like um, uh, way to, a uh, syndrome term, basically. And so his mother was unable to advocate for Sar's return. She'd lost her husband, and now her brother had become head of household, the uncle. And this is also a tremendously important issue when you think of Sar's social ecology because the uncle saw the boy as shameful and was rejecting of him. And Sar started to have community difficulties, as they did for most of the kids who returned after the war. People in the community would jeer, point at him, tease and taunt him, and see how he would react when provoked. And he had a very depressed mother and the head of household who really you look to to step in and defend a young person uh, was not there for Sar. So he started to have these community problems. Uh, and a number of occasions, people surrounded him, beat him, saying they were correcting his behavior. The mother would come and break up these fights and say she didn't see why you would beat the boy in the name of trying to correct his behavior. Um, but over time, he started to have real problems with people in the community. He eventually dropped out of school. And the last time we interviewed Sar, he was unemployed and living on another farm just for room and board, um, no income. And his mother said he was such an agreeable boy before he'd been abducted. So here's a life trajectory of a boy who, taken at age seven, has gone on a very different path. And if you look at SARS quantitative data, you see here on the internalizing outcome, he's sort of within a standard deviation of his male peers. So he looks like a lot of the other boys in the sample. But when it comes to externalizing, he's ticking up over time. So by wave three, he's a full standard deviation above his male peers. And then look what's going on with his adaptive and um, pro-social behavior. He's falling so that by wave three, he's a full standard deviation below the other boys in the sample as well. So it's young people like that that we really worry about um, in thinking of intervention programs. This study has documented a tremendous amount of resilience. When you look at trajectories of these outcomes over time, we see that, on, in general, a lot of young people, their symptoms are improving even without a lot of access to care. There's a tremendous amount of religious support, collective society, um, and it's about 12% of the sample that's at a very elevated level of symptoms are getting worse over time. Uh, and we see some specificity in war experiences and what they relate to, surviving rape being related to depression and anxiety, participating in injury and killing others related to hostility and deficits in pro-social behavior. Death of a caregiver, which I didn't show you as many analyses on that, also related to depression and anxiety. Um, but there are these post-conflict factors too, which are really important because we can't undo those war experiences. But we can do something about community relationships, social support, access to school, how people are dealing with having access to a livelihood and daily hardships. And that's where we start to think about what are intervention models that could leverage some of those modifiable factors. And it's young people with these problems with emotion regulation and daily functioning that we're really concerned about when it comes to how they're doing out there in the world. Um, and here's an example of why. So here's a typical school um, for war-affected youth. This is called Educate, and we collaborated with them in the trial that was published in JCAP. Uh, now, Educate is free if you're a young person living in poverty in Sierra Leone, uh, but they do expect you to pay a few small fees. Excellent attendance, excellent behavior, and excellent effort. So take a young person like Sar. Can Sar pay these fees? Right? So and we see girls who look just like Sar. And so the question becomes, as opportunities become available post-conflict to attend school, to be in employment programs, how can we make sure that it's not just the high functioning and connected young people who are getting those opportunities? Because that's what's happening. Uh, now the World Bank, DFID, um, other development actors are investing in Sierra Leone. 
Uh, there was a $20 million youth employment program. The World Bank were negotiating with them about what they're doing with their next youth employment program. Um, but there are huge subgroups of youth who are unable to benefit um, from these life opportunities without addressing these issues of emotion regulation, interpersonal relationships, and daily functioning. So this brought us to the development of what we call the youth readiness intervention. Now this is basically CBT and a little bit of IPT thrown in rebranded for policy people in Sierra Leone. When you say mental health, their eyes glaze over when you talk to the Minister of Labor. You say readiness, readiness to work, readiness to go to school, you're in a very different place. Uh, so this is how we developed the Youth Readiness Intervention. We collaborated with a grant from the Harvard Catalyst with John Wise, um, who's one of the premier thinkers on evidence-based psychotherapies for children and adolescents <coughs> and youth. One of his postdocs, Sarah Kate Berman, who's now junior faculty, Nate Hansen here at Yale at the time, and at Adeyinka Akinsulari Smith, um, who's my collaborator at CUNY. She's also a psychologist from Sierra Leone herself, uh, so a tremendously important partner when it comes to training and supervision. And so we went back to our mixed method selves. We did focus groups with young people, with stakeholders who knew youth programs in Sierra Leone. Uh, we talked to young people in communities. We set up a youth advisory board and a stakeholder advisory board. And then we started to review components of evidence-based interventions that could be feasible but safe in Sierra Leone, knowing that we had some serious contextual realities to contend with. First is the reality of limited human resources. Sierra Leone is a country of six million people. It has one quasi-retired psychiatrist for the whole country most conflict and close to Ebola. So any of you psychiatrists here who'd like to work in Sierra Leone, you could you know, triple, double um, the availability of psychiatric services in Sierra Leone. Um, there's a handful of uh, PhD psychologists, a few master's professionals. And so we had to think about ways that we could conceptualize intervention that could be done by people with a very basic level of training who got excellent training in addition and excellent supervision and think about group models because it's a collectivist culture, what's appropriate for group work as opposed to individual services. Individual services um, are available technically and through the outpatient service of this one psychiatrist, but I don't know if anyone's um, heard about Kissy Mental Hospital in Sierra Leone, but it's really a place rife with human rights abuses. Patients are chained to beds. Jim, did you see it when you went? Um, it's it's a, a very frightening place and it contributes to stigma because people think of mental health as going to kissy and being chained to your bed in rags and suffering. And so nobody wants to get mental health services because they're highly frightening and stigmatizing. It's something that people misunderstand. And so we also had to think about com comorbidity. Um, young people don't just present with clean depression or clean traumatic stress reactions or conduct problems solely. Uh, that there's a lot of comorbidity in these um, different symptom presentations. And we have to think about transdiagnostic interventions um, that can be effective across a range of problem areas and deficits in function. And then lastly, we can't do standalone mental health. We have to link to life opportunities uh, for education or for employment because those livelihoods and um, post-conflict hardship issues are so incredibly important. So here are the six uh, components of the youth readiness intervention. You see sort of the flow that uh, you'd expect in a lot of trauma-informed interventions that were first focused on stabilization, integration of those skills, connection to others in those interpersonal relationships. Um, this was after review with a lot of our key stakeholders on what was feasible, safe, but also had a strong evidence base behind it. So certainly psychoeducation on trauma and its effects on your sense of self and your relationship with others. Emotion regulation skills. Um, so that young people can identify when they're being triggered, how to regulate their reaction to those stressors and triggers in their environment. And then cognitive restructuring is probably one of the more complicated things we do to really challenge negative self-perceptions and your perception of the world around you. Um, behavioral activation, which has a huge evidence base uh, in the treatment of depression, just being busy, um, being in contact with other people, getting out of social isolation like we saw with SARS situation. And then once we've sort of built up some of these skills, then we move into more of the interpersonal work with the groups. And they think about improving their interpersonal skills and their communication skills, how to present their best self to others. And also problem solving and working towards life goals. And we use SMART goals and sort of setting feasible goals and moving towards them step by step. And the group could be used to do that and really support young people through that process. 
Um, we did not do in-depth trauma processing or anything uh, like that because of safety issues. You know, we're realizing these are groups done by lay people. And we've got to think about feasibility and safety issues and how that's handled in terms of content. So it's trauma-informed, um, but we're not trying to do any exposure therapy in these groups. Um, so I'm these treatment more components... about the uh, actual Sorry? people who are doing the, the providing of the service. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about okay. that in the training and supervision for sure. sure. So these treatments, uh, these components have a very strong evidence base in the U.S. and U.K., but we don't know a lot about how they work in these sorts of settings, especially war-affected settings. Uh, another thing we have to deal with is literacy issues. So we can't give homework assignments and workbooks and things like that. You have young people who don't have basic literacy skills. So we use a lot of proverbs, and our qualitative work has helped us arrive at uh, sayings in Creo that young people have heard growing up that they can connect to. Um, so since there are no Creo speakers here, I will uh, botch one for you. One of my favorites is number four. If you take tam ki anchi go siem got, which if you translate, it's a great example of an idiom. If you translate it to English, it means if you take time when killing an ant, you'll get to see its guts. I say, well, why would you want to do that? Um, but in Sierra Leone, everyone nods and says, oh, yes, because it means if you stay focused, you will achieve your goal. And everybody can relate to that, and they've heard it their whole lives. And so each one of these proverbs relates to something like that and addresses one of our treatment components. Uh, we do a lot of community outreach where we negotiate space that's in the community. You don't have mental health outpatient clinics that young people can go to. You certainly don't want to go to Kissy Mental Hospital. Um, so we are negotiating space in the community, in the schools, when they're not being used. Sometimes village leaders will let us use their property in a confidential space to hold the group. And then we uh, also had to modify a lot of the metaphors for communicating different skills, uh, especially from a C CBT perspective. So sometimes you'll see in treatment manuals something like talking about emotion dysregulation, like a television set that's turned up super loud or a train speeding out of control. So that doesn't really fly easily uh, as a metaphor for young people in rural Sierra Leone. But we can talk about a pot of water coming to a boil and how a pot of water doesn't just go from being cool to being a raging boil. It starts to heat and percolate and little bubbles start to form and before you know it, it's come to a boil. That you can start to tell when you're getting triggered, you're starting to heat up, your pot of water is starting to heat. And the young people in the groups actually use this metaphor of removing a little bit of wood underneath the pot to cool it. And what are the ways that they can best remove that little piece of wood? What are the coping techniques that work for them? And this has become a very powerful metaphor uh, for talking about emotion regulation. Uh, we do a tremendous amount, as Jim asked, around capacity building and sustainability. A sad truth of Sierra Leone is that after the war, there were many psychosocial workers trained. These are teachers, Jim and Alamami, who become two of our expert trainers and supervisors. They worked with non-governmental organizations um, during the refugee displacements after the war and had been underemployed for years. And so they have a tremendous amount of knowledge and skill in working with vulnerable populations. And they become some of our expert trainers working with Dr. Atkins and Larry Smith to learn the treatment components and then train and supervise for looking at fidelity to what we're trying to do in Sierra Leone. So these local partnerships become incredibly important. When we do the clinical training, we basically run the groups in role play in the local language. You see um, Yinka there behind everybody. And we're using local examples. So the girls' groups uh, are very different in terms of the examples they use than the boys' groups. We divide the groups by age and gender. And this, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the trial that we published um, in JCAP a few years ago uh, that um, was the basis for them thinking about um, taking this intervention into new directions. <coughs> and so uh, we knew a little bit about distress in this population from the longitudinal study. We were able to set a criteria for elevated distress. It was about a half a standard deviation above our sample mean in the child soldier study, so already a pretty elevated sample. Uh, they had to have some impairment in day-to-day -day functioning to enter the trial and be school intending, meaning if they had the chance to go back to school, they would take it. And we went for high generalizability, so males and females, not knowing if this was going to be as effective in um, both genders. And then we're targeting the UN definition of youth, which is 15 to 24. So we have groups for under 18s and groups for over 18s separated by gender. Uh, this is a flow of our uh, screening for eligibility in the trial in just a matter of weeks. We were able to screen 761 youth and identify 436 who met those criteria. 
We then randomized half the sample um, to going straight into the Educate program, half to getting the readiness intervention before they went on to Educate, and then continued to follow them up um, pre and post intervention, and then once um, eight months into the Education program. So here are our methods. Uh, implementation of the Youth Readiness Intervention was 10 weeks. Uh, sessions were once weekly for about 90 minutes to two hours. They were led by two community lay workers who delivered the intervention in teams. Uh, they got the two-week training course, but they also got a lot of supervision. Weekly group supervision and weekly individual supervision. And I think in working in the resource settings, there's a little too much focus on just training and not enough on supervision. Mm -hmm. And really professional development and monitoring risk of harm issues and um, also just people's own self-care when they're working. They're often conflict affected themselves. And so our main outcomes here are emotion regulation. We're looking at some of those other scales I showed you before, pro-social attitudes and behaviors, overall total problems, distress, social support, and daily functioning. And then we had qualitative interviews on um, satisfaction um, and other elements of how they felt about getting the treatment. So here are our two groups, the intervention, the control group at baseline. You see average age is about 18. Very high levels of war experiences. This is many years out. This is 2012, so many years after the war of 1991. But tremendously high numbers separated from a caregiver, lost a family or friend member, uh, a friend or family member died due to the war, exposure to armed conflict directly, and also being a member of armed groups. Now we, because of stigma, don't target just child soldiers. We've realized that that's a bit of a red herring. To, sing, to sort of single kids out as um, not something we're looking to do and have intervention groups just for former child soldiers because everyone's war affected in settings like this. But we do have a small subset um, who are also members of armed forces and armed groups. Um, and that's just by screening out in the community. And so here are our intervention effects. So pre to post intervention, uh, we see that the intervention group is showing significant effects on improving emotion regulation. Uh, improved social, uh, pro-social behavior, and these are both effect size of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Uh, improvements in functional impairment on the HUDAS, uh, which this is really important when it comes to global mental health. Symptoms uh, are extremely important, but if you can improve day-to-day -day functioning and things like education and employment programs, you're in a very different space. Um, and then also improvements in social support, certainly in those who are more severe, we're seeing higher effects. And in terms of six months out, the persistence of these effects is mainly in those who have a higher level of severity. So, you know, a lot of this is still washing out after 10 weeks of intervention delivered by lay people. Um, but we did see some exciting traction on other elements of functioning, which was in uh, school participation and school behavior. So teachers were also enrolled in the trial. They didn't know who got what intervention. They were blind to status. Um, but they also rated those who got the readiness intervention as having better classroom performance and better attitudes and behaviors. So that put us in a very different place in terms of starting to talk to the policy players um, in terms of improving youth's ability to connect to life opportunities. Here's a quote from one of our female participants. I didn't know how to interact with people. I was so aggressive. But since I went through the intervention, my life has changed. Um, so just to wrap up and tell you about the policy environment, um, so there is a mental health policy and strategic plan in Sierra Leone. It was launched in 2012. Um, but as you saw, the health system is, has been in collapse since the Ebola epidemic. It's a very difficult time to really try to broaden mental health um, through the Ministry of Health. They believe in it, um, they're invested, but they just don't have the resources. And, but what's exciting with interventions like this that can have an impact on functioning is development actors get very excited to think about the fact that the World Bank and all the countries where it works, it's having the most difficulty getting traction in conflict-affected countries. Uh, and those are the ones where a lot of those youth employment programs or education programs don't have the same um, success. And just getting youth engaged and retaining them in those services is a very important part of that. So uh, we can start to think about alternate ways to get these mental health services to young people through youth employment, through education programs like we showed in the trial. So we wrote a grant um, to the National Institutes of Mental Health uh, for a scale-up study and to do more implementation science research and mental health services research around this topic. And we're funded to launch uh, an initiative that we call Youth Forward which is a mental health services research hub to look at alternate delivery platforms and implementation models for bringing evidence-based behavioral interventions to scale for youth that face adversity in West Africa. So we have a capacity building element in Liberia and Sierra Leone, and then a scale-up study uh, underway in Sierra Leone where we want to really look at this issue of training and supervision, actually. 
How, you know, we can't have Yinka flying out as the expert trainer all the time. How can we shift ownership for the intervention to the local agencies? And so we've been looking at working with school programs or youth employment programs to establish interagency collaborative teams. And this, would, this is a model that's been used to scale up um, the Safe Care a Child Protection Service in the state of California. And you develop a seed team at the agency level, they become the expert trainers and supervisors. So some of our big research questions are around the feasibility of this. And when we do this, our service is sustained with quality, with fidelity, and what is the experience of the providers. So we start to look at those provider level questions, as well as do we replicate our effectiveness results when we take this to youth employment programs or other sectors. Um, we're also continuing to uh, focus on the intergenerational effects of war. This is a commentary I wrote in JAMA Psychiatry on the topic. Um, our NICHD R01 is now in the last few months of data collection. Uh, we've now been able to recontact 337 participants. We're still chasing around the last 90 or so. Uh, it's interesting to see that about half are partnered. Uh, very high rates of unemployment still. And then in terms of children, a majority of the sample uh, do have children, and some of them have many children. So we're enrolling all of those young people uh, into the study now, as well as intimate partners. So if you're interested in intergenerational issues and high-risk samples, come and talk to me. We're going to have a lot of data to be working with uh, over the years ahead, and it's just now coming in. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, mental health and functioning in more effective youth, as you see, are critical issues in global mental health and public health. Uh, we have real options to think about adapting evidence-based interventions in these settings. They're feasible, they can have an impact, but we have to think about other ways to get those interventions out there, be they school systems, be they poverty reduction strategies, youth employment programs. And the questions that loom large going forward are implementation science questions. How do we sustain quality? How do we think about cost? How do we translate these findings to policy actors? How do we build human resources and transition ownership for evidence-based services um, to partners in the ground, building capacity at agencies, universities, governments, and eventually to arrive at the kind of sustainability that we hope for in this work? Um, so with that, I'll wrap up, and thank you. So we have a little time for questions, right? Because that clock's Yes, yeah, Jim. It's such an honor to have you with us, and uh, thank you so much for making time to be part of this uh, Grand Rounds presentation. And I guess it's impossible to hear you present without being so impressed with your ability to sort of form these multi-sectorial partnerships and, and move forward, and to actually bring programs like this to a sustainable level yeah. with fidelity. I mean, it's a model for all of us. And of course, here at the Child Study Center, and I think I've asked you this question before, uh, it's just fascinating to think about the next generation. And are you keeping track of any of the child outcomes of the children that were born to this cohort? Or, exactly. Yeah. And, so I didn't and, go into our and, battery. Like, where do things stand with that? I'm just curious. Yeah. So this is where I'm inviting interesting minds to give us thoughts. We'll be looking at sort of three specific aims. We'll be looking at adult mental health and functioning but also interpersonal relationships. So those are attachment relationships with your own children, your partner relationships, both the positive and you know the sort of violent elements of intimate partner relationships as well. Um, we have certain hypotheses about the mechanisms by which there could be intergenerational transmission of emotional and behavioral disruptions due to past trauma, mainly through attachment and through violence in the household. It's probably in a gendered sort of differential. Um, and then we'll be looking at the offspring and we have uh, standard, you know, this is a bit challenging when you talk about doing real world because we can't say I'm only taking two year olds. Mm -hmm. They're whatever age they are. So we've enrolled all their biological children, but you see there's a pretty sizable sample that we'll be um, looking at. And so we're gonna have to cluster, you know, so we have our sort of um, zero to three <coughs> battery, we have our preschool battery, and then we have our seven and older battery, um, which starts to then have more self report. Um, and we'll be looking at those sort of clusters and what are the predictors in terms of uh, the association between past parental trauma to attachment, to child development, to school readiness, to emotional and behavioral health, and to other health indicators too. Uh, so 
we're fingers crossed on where things land with sample size, um, but that's what we'll be looking at next. But you're clearly going to have a positive impact on so many families, so thank you. Yeah, well, we're trying, and we invite more people. I, I do appreciate it. It's, it's very kind words. It's very challenging work, and, you know, I'm meeting with the World Bank tomorrow because they're already changing the youth employment program that we were going to link to. So <laughs> this is implementation science. You're in the real world, and it's challenging, but it's worth it if you can do it. Yes, hard. Hi, so I'm Carrie. I'm actually from the trauma section and so excited to hear about your work, especially I'm also a master trainer in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy wow. at TSBT and I, I, I get very excited because I don't, I, I see how consistent it is with the TFCBT studies that are happening um, throughout um, Africa. There was a study in the Democratic uh, Republic of Republic Congo. Congo about yeah. boys exposed to war, yeah. girls, the sexually exploited girls, yeah. commercially trafficked girls, and very similar outcomes with groups, yeah. um, similar kinds of numbers of um, sessions, and not only lowering PTSD, anxiety, shame and behavior issues, but also raising pro-social involvement. And so I find it really exciting um, to sort of see the consistency, um, also dealing with the same dissemination science challenges yeah. that about you don't have a lot of master's level, you don't have PhD level folks down there, so how do you do the training? Using Skype to give ongoing supervision, how do you pass it down to them to run it? Um, and so I find it really exciting and would love to talk more because yeah. there's such wonderful consistency and outcome, which means you know, great things. That means we're really honing in on some of the best practices. So yeah. it's just, it's a great thing to see. Yeah, that's, that's an important um, comment to bring in the other exciting research that's been done in DRC and TFCBT has been adapted to a few war affected settings. And I think we're all finding similar things when we get to the point that you can do an RCT. That's, you can get you know exciting effects in RCT, but you're not done at the RCT by mm -hmm. far. And we have to think about implementation science questions. And once we're done with that nice study, which is still effectiveness because it's in real world settings, we're not in labs, but still, What's going to happen after that? The and there have been so many, around. yeah, lovely trials where, yeah. like Rwanda where I work, I've seen so many studies where I've gone back to those researchers who did the trials and they're like, where's your intervention? Who owns it? Who's doing it now? And a lot of times, if you don't deal with these implementation science questions on how do you sustain fidelity, how do you think about other elements of quality, of satisfaction of the providers, how do you translate and get the buy-in of agency leads, how do you cost it, how do you get people to pay for it? Uh, it doesn't matter. Right. So those implementation science questions are really the big 